All right, welcome folks. Uh, it's one o'clock, so we're gonna get started pretty soon. Uh, as folks trickle in here, I'm just going to uh, post a poll that we'll uh, conduct in the meantime while we give folks another minute or two. All right, welcome everybody. Let's sort of get this uh, get this going. So I'm going to close the poll and let's see. Let's share those results. So we've got a pretty pretty bit of a distribution here. Lots of folks just starting to learn about edge lane roads. Lots of folks have some information, and a few folks have got a solid understanding, but no experts. So hopefully we can hopefully we can get some experts today. Um, so, you know, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our Learning Network event today. I'm Jonathan Weber. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Complete Streets Program Manager here at Local Motion. Our mission is to make biking and walking a way of life across Vermont. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get rolling today. Um, everyone's going to be muted through the presentation, but please do post your questions in the questions box, and we'll get to them during our discussion at the end. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can post those in the question box or contact me with the info shown on the current slide, uh, which I'll also post in the chat. Um, today's webinar is being recorded, and we're going to share that out in a follow-up email uh, that you'll receive a few hours after we wrap up. Uh, you're welcome to share that email with anyone you think might be interested. They'll be able to view the recording. So our focus today is on edge lane roads. Uh, you might know these as advisory lanes, uh, but you know the idea is one and the same, sort of edge lanes on each side of the road where vulnerable users have the right of way, and a center lane that's shared by motorists who can use the edge lanes when passing oncoming vehicles if there are no users in the edge lanes. So this is a very adaptable treatment, and I think it could work well on a lot of our narrow Vermont roads. Our presenter today is Michael Williams, who's considered one of the foremost experts and researchers on edge lane roads in the US. Uh, Michael Williams is a transportation consultant with more than a decade of experience as a licensed general contractor on public works projects. And uh, he's got three engineering degrees, including an MS in civil engineering. So I'm gonna stop, stop sharing my screen and stop talking and uh, turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, I'm attempting to pick the screen I'm showing. And you should see my title slide now, Jonathan? Yep, very good. Excellent, okay, well, my name is Michael Williams and Jonathan just uh, stole the thunder out of my first four or five slides. So, uh, but we'll go through them anyway, uh, in case you didn't quite catch uh, what he said. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today are edge lane roads in Vermont. Uh, a lot of this information is available on my website at edgelaneroads.com, also known as advisorybikelanes.com. And there's quite a bit of additional information available there as well. Here's an outline of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, before I go over the outline, uh, Jonathan asked me to mention that the FHWA has recently decided to stop considering uh, any future applications for requests to experiment with this treatment. They feel they have enough experiments already to evaluate the treatment. Uh, there are a number of us that disagree with that decision and with that rationale. Uh, I can go into that more at the end of the presentation, but uh, do be aware that there's an effort to uh, encourage the FHWA to reconsider their, their current decision. 
All right, hey, so that, Michael, we just had a request. Can you um, maybe go into landscape mode or make the your presentation window larger? It's as large as I can make it. Um, okay, I can see it fine, but we had we had a comment. All right, is it so? It is legible. It's legible for me. Yeah. Is there a full screen option that you can do, or are you already full screen? I'm already on, I'm already full screen. Okay. So uh, I'm not sure what's going on there, but I, I think it'll be uh, visible. Yeah. Um, so the outline for today's presentation, we're going to talk about what edge lane roads are. We're going to talk about the their international American presence, the experience that uh, the world has with them. We're going to look at the safety performance of this treatment. And we're going to look at some examples of how edge lane roads can be used in the U.S., are being used in the U.S. I think it, that is going to uh, open up your minds about uh, what this treatment is usable for, what it's good at doing, and then wrap up at the, at the end there. So, introduction to edge lane roads. Well, we, if you take a look at the paved road miles in the U.S., uh, they're really dominated by local and collector roads. We've got more than 2 million miles of paved local and collector roads. And these are the roads that most of us use every day to visit friends and family. We go to work, we take our kids to school, we go to school, uh, we go to the store, et cetera. And because of their lower volume and lower speed, many of these roads are good candidates for on-street uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities. But multiplying even a conservative percentage of those miles by the cost to install bicycle facilities and or sidewalks gives you costs in the billions of dollars in time frames in multiple decades. And a lot of these roads are too narrow. They don't have the right of way width to easily add those facilities. But we have a new type of roadway known as an edge lane road or ELR that can help with these cost and width issues as well as with uh, uh, be a tool in the toolbox for agencies that are looking to uh, provide for their vulnerable road users. So what is an edge lane road? Well an edge lane road is a roadway that supports two-way motor vehicle traffic in a single center lane and vulnerable road users in the edge lanes on either side. In order to pass approaching motor vehicles Drivers merge into those edge lanes after yielding to any vulnerable road users. Uh, they make the pass and return to the center lane. An important point with this treatment is there is no center line. And as shown on this slide, we, got, we have a schematic diagram to the left showing the edge lanes and the center lanes and uh, my preferred marking scheme. Uh, this is not MUTCD issued but uh, it's my favorite for uh, for the treatment and of course on the right a, an edge lane road in the wild that one is in the Netherlands using their uh, very pleasant red coloring for the bike facilities. Sorry to interrupt Michael just a quick um, on the screen size users you do uh, at the top there's there are three options there's webcam zoom and screenshot above the presentation view and uh, you can use that zoom function to get a larger view of the slides. Are you talking about on the go to control panel? Above, just right above where folks, does, uh, yeah, you don't need to do anything, Michael, just for attendees where you see the slides, above that there's a zoom button and you can use that to get a larger view. But you're all set to keep going as you were, Michael, thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. And so just to reiterate, here are a couple of pictures from the Small Town Rural multi Multimodal Networks Guide. On the left shows uh, a standard situation. You've got a couple of cyclists on the road, the drivers in the middle, and on the right showing two cars passing one another. But a lot of people look at this treatment and are incredulous. They are absolutely certain that we're courting fiery destruction and they were codifying a game of chicken on your public streets. Uh, well to those people I say no, uh, just relax. We have decades of use 
We have many successful examples and we have published design guidance for this treatment. Uh, and the, the type of driving that uh, an edge lane road requires is a type of driving that people do every day all across the country. Uh, here's a, a picture of a residential street clogged with parked cars or a narrow street with parked cars on one side. In both those situations, drivers slowly negotiate with passage, with approaching cars for passage. You pull over and wait where a driveway has created a hole in the, in the on-street parking. Uh, so these types of streets, streets narrowly cleared of snow after a snowstorm, uh, narrow lanes and alleys, shopping market parking lots, one lane bridges, et cetera. Uh, there's examples all over the country every day where driving uh, in this manner is expected and really uh, not even paid attention to by most drivers. So we have some, uh, I, ha I have some examples of American edge lane road installations here that I'd like to show you. First one is in Hanover, New Hampshire. This is a rural suburban kind of treatment. Uh, no sidewalks, curbs, or gutters, obviously. This is a neighborhood where they didn't want sidewalks. They didn't want to spoil the rural nature of their neighborhood. So they chose the Edge Lane Road treatment and it's been working very well for them. Here are a couple local installations in Vermont. Uh, there are two in Burlington. The one pictured here is on Queen City Park Road. And then we have one in Lincoln, Vermont. Here's a picture of one in Minneapolis. Uh, Minneapolis has a number of installations. The one shown here is on East 14th. It's probably one of the busiest and most urban edge lane roads in the country. Uh, this particular installation gets up around 5,000, 6,000 ADT. Uh, you've got a hospital, a univer private university down at one end, a uh, very commercial. Uh, urban type of setting for that street. So now that we know what they are, how they work, let's talk about how they've been used and our experience with them. Uh, in 2013, the International Transport Forum uh, commissioned a report, and as part of that report, they asked countries if they had used this treatment and if they had, when they had started using it. Uh, and this, this survey was uh, conducted mostly with Western developed nations. Uh, and in the 21 countries surveyed, there were, I think that's 10 in the list, uh, they found 10 that had been using this treatment, three of them obviously by now using them for more than 50 years. Uh, some of the other countries had started using them uh, later in life. Here in America, we had our first installation in 2011. That was the one I just showed you a picture of in Minneapolis on East 14th. And as of late summer, early fall of this year, we had approximately 60 that I was aware of. Uh, that includes two in Canada, that number includes two, so about 58 in the US. I haven't updated my, my installations over time slide in quite a while, but if you notice, the 2019 number is just shy of 30. So here in 2021, we've got double that number. So that graph is continuing to uh, scale upward rather quickly. The treatment does exist in some of the official American guidance that's out there now. The 2016 Small Towns Guide was really the first big piece of guidance that uh, included the treatment. The 2019 FHWA Bikeway Selection Guide also includes it. We've got a number of Canadian guides that include the treatment and the upcoming revision of AASHTO's Bicycle Guide uh, should be out in 2022, also includes treatment once for pedestrians and once for bicyclists. It's currently classified as an experimental treatment by the FHWA. What that means is the FHWA wants to gather data 
on how this treatment works, how safe it is, how it operates, uh, how it's being rolled out. And classifying a treatment as experimental is a way to grab that data. Uh, the NCUTCD-BTC, I'll go over what that big long string of letters means. Uh, they are drafting language for the MUTCD to support Edge Lane Road specifically. And just to backtrack, uh, NCUTCD is a National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. That's a volunteer organization uh, with quite a breadth of representation that is responsible for creating much of the content in the MUTCD. The FHWA is the owner of that document. They have the final say, but the NCUTCD is uh, really quite a heavy player in, in what content that is. The BTC is the Bicycle Technical Committee within the NCUTCD. I do want to make one comment on the guidance, especially on the Small Towns and Rural Multimodal Networks Guide. That's the only guide that has any real design guidance so far. And I would like to caution people to take that design guidance with a large grain of salt. Uh, a lot of the design guidance in that guide was created without much research. Uh, some of the recommendations directly conflict with recommendations from guidance in other countries with decades more experience than us in this treatment. Uh, and I consider it a, a beta version, if you will. Uh, the, Ash the upcoming Ashto bike guide addresses a lot of those problems. Uh, but things like center lane width, site distance criterion, uh, things like that are, I would not recommend them in that guide. So let's talk about safety performance. Now that we know that these things exist in guidance and are being taken seriously, uh, what is the verdict? on how these things uh, perform safety wise. So previously, up until about a year ago, we didn't have a whole lot of research on installations in the US. Uh, what I did do is I called all of the agencies that were known to have edge lane road installations and I looked at reports done by some of those agencies for their uh, FHWA art request to experiment process. The six installations that had finished their experimental process, in their reports, uh, they all found no head-on collisions, no issues due to a misunderstanding of the road's operation, and all of those installations found a reduction or no change in crash rate, motor vehicle speed, and motor vehicle volumes. But we have to acknowledge that these were simple before after studies, uh, and some of them re only relied on data from single days or a limited number of days. So that's what we had up until about a year ago. Uh, a year ago, we had a, a report published by the Mineta Transportation Institute, which looked at 11 American edge lane roads. These roads were uh, studied for five years prior to the installation of the Edge Lane Road treatment and for three years following Edge Lane Road installation. Uh, this time frame and the total number of facilities translated to more than 60 million motor vehicle trips. And what we found in that study was that uh, and, and I want to make sure and point out that we used a, an empirical Bayes analysis method specified in the Highway Safety Manual. So this is a, a real study. All we did was look at motor vehicle crashes. We didn't have the data necessary to evaluate bicycle and pedestrian uh, safety, unfortunately. But what we found was an aggregate crash modification factor of 0.56. That translates to a 44% reduction in crash rate over the standard two-lane configuration. So that was that was big news uh, for the for the states in this treatment, and that lines up well with experience we've seen uh, from studies both in the Denmark in Denmark and the Netherlands, uh, where 
they combined ed the edge lane road treatment with some other countermeasures. And uh, Denmark, as all as you can see here from the slide, uh, edge lane roads and traffic calming combined gave a 32% reduction in crashes. Edge lane roads with a speed limit reduction gave a 47% crash rate reduction. They saw no impact on crashes caused by snow and ice, alcohol, or darkness. And in the Netherlands, they did uh, edge lane road treatment along with a speed limit reduction, and they saw a 24% crash rate reduction. So all of these uh, studies point in the right direction and show a significant reduction in crash rate. So now that we're familiar with them, we know that they're safe and that they work, I want to dive into a few different examples of how this treatment's been used. Uh, most people look at this treatment as a way to put bike lanes on a street that is too narrow for standard bike lanes. And while that is a possible use for this treatment, there are a lot of other uses. And, uh, and I think this first one's gonna be um, surprising for some of you that haven't seen my previous uh, presentations. So in some cases, I'm gonna tell you that edge lane roads are better than standard bike lanes. So why is that? Well, this, this uh, slide shows you probably on the top image, uh, the bike facility that's most common in our country. Standard bike lane, I even gave it a six foot width. Uh, I'd wager 70 or 80% of them out there are five feet width only. But that six foot bike lane is sandwiched in between on-street parking and the travel lane, moving cars. Uh, and if you subtract out a three foot door zone, what you're left with is the minimum ashto operating width for a bicyclist five feet hard up against a moving car in the middle of a 10 foot drive lane so really not a whole lot of room for a bicyclist on what is likely the most common bicycle facility out there now if this road is a candidate for an edge lane road treatment as you see in the bottom image the clearance is much improved. You can throw in a hatched out buffer to eliminate door zone issues and also give room for uh, things that always end up on your street. And they usually end up in the bike lane if there's a bike lane there, right? Garbage cans, piles of leaves, uh, people taking stuff out of their trunk and setting them down on the car, uh, people walking to their cars. So, you get a buffer there, you've got a place for all those odds and ends that always ends up in the bike lane. You also can end up with a bike lane that's very wide. It supports side-by-side -side riding. It supports bike bicyclists being able to pass other bicyclists safely. And in the common case where you have a single bike bicyclist, you have an enormous increase in the horizontal distance uh, between moving traffic and the vulnerable bicyclists. And I'm not the only one to think of, think this because the city of Utrecht in the Netherlands, which is probably the most bicycle forward, most progressive city in the world, they're often voted as the most friend, bicycle friendliest city in the Netherlands. Uh, what they saw, what they had was a, a road here, Molly Single, and that's mangled, excuse any, Dutch folks that cringe at my pronunciation. Here's the standard street, bike lanes on both sides, parking on one side, a canal on the other, 50 kilometers an hour speed limit. Utrecht wasn't happy with that. That wasn't comfortable enough. They didn't like it. They wanted to improve the street. So what did they do? They transformed it into an edge lane road. They also reduced the speed limit down to 30 kilometers an hour but they had enormous success with this transformation. As you can see from the table on the right, bike volume shot up from about 5,000 to almost 6,500. Automobile volume dropped from 6,000 to nearly 4,000. These are all per day numbers. And of course the speeds dropped as well because 
well, let's just face it, the Dutch are better drivers than we are. Uh, so a very convincing, very successful uh, uh, use case here. Sidewalks, this is a tough one. Uh, as we all know, there are a lot of roads, rural roads especially, that aren't going to get sidewalks for decades, if ever. Uh, the edge lane road treatment can provide side, sidewalks quickly and cheaply. And I shouldn't call them sidewalks, I prefer to call them pedestrian facilities. But there's limited guidance on use of this treatment for pedestrians. And there's some unresolved ADA issues regarding detectable warning surfaces uh, and slopes. But that doesn't mean people don't do it. Yarmouth, Maine had a bridge here on Bridge Street, appropriately enough. Uh, this is the bridge as it existed before. It has a narrow ledge on either side where pedestrians can seek refuge when two cars need to pass one another. Uh, the state DOT came in, revamped the railing on this bridge and removed that ledge. And the towns complained and said, hey, we want, we want our ledge back. We want some sort of pedestrian facility. The DOT said, no, we can't do that. So what the city did is they installed an edge lane road treatment to create a pedestrian facility on their own. Now note this, this uh, treatment uses yellow. And the reason for that is they wanted to be sure that the lines were visible on the, on the gray concrete deck. But this is one example, there are others where an agency used the edge lane road treatment specifically to support pedestrians. Now, of course, it, it will accommodate cyclists as well, uh, but pedestrians were the primary benefactors in this case. Bicycle boulevards. Now, bicycle boulevards, uh, background on this, it, it's not a treatment, despite people uh, regarding a bicycle boulevard as a treatment, it's really a designation, right? It's a route onto which treatments are applied to prioritize non-vehicular travel. Uh, bicycle boulevards are usually posted between 15 and 25 miles an hour in the U.S. Uh, NACTO recommends 1,500 cars a day or less for bicycle boulevards but you have an issue with the standard two lane type of behavior. When drivers come up behind cyclists, they either choose to accelerate and pass the cyclist, or they slow and stay behind the cyclist. And both of these are disturbing. If you're a cyclist and you're accustomed to traveling on roads, residential roads, uh, the one thing that always or at least it does me, make you cringe a bit, is hearing those revs climb up in anticipation of the driver passing you. Uh, you don't know really what's going on. All you know is that engine is coming up and they're gonna speed up. The other issue is when they slow and stay behind you. And as I was talking to Jonathan the other day, I said, nobody likes being at the head of a parade. And you especially don't like being at the head of the parade when the guy behind you is a two-ton piece of metal. So there's an issue with the standard two-lane road uh, configuration and the behavior that results from that. Far better to provide space for both road user types. And obviously this is exactly what an edge lane road does for you. Here's an approximately 40 foot width of asphalt uh, with on-street parking on both sides. Again, it's a, it's a relatively wide parking lane well, urban-wise, eight foot. You've got very wide bike lanes on either side, plenty of width for side-by-side -side riding, and of course, a, a 10 foot wide center lane. The only time cars will need to use those edge lanes is when they need to pass one another. And on low volume roads, this happens uh, not infrequently. So for Bicycle Boulevards, you get exclusive lanes for both your road user types, except when cars are passing one another. The narrow center lanes can exert a traffic calming influence. You get a facility which encourages side-by-side -side riding, allows bike-bike passing. Uh, and I'm not the first person to think of this. The 2009 Fundamentals of Bicycle Boulevard Planning and Design Guide 
still an excellent reference, by the way, for Bicycle Boulevard design, uh, mentions advisory bike lanes as a preferred design for a bicycle boulevard. So I firmly believe this treatment should be part of your bicycle boulevard toolkit. And how about your downtown Main Street? So here's Port Townsend, Washington. Beautiful little town, uh, but their problem is they have no alleys behind their, uh, their main buildings on their downtown uh, street. And what that has resulted in is they allow delivery trucks to park in the middle of the road in order to load and off, uh, unload and load uh, deliveries. Now this picture, there are a couple things I wanna know with this picture. Number one, there appears to be a center line on this road. That's not true, that's some leftover marking from the repaving reconstruction project that was done. That is gone by now. Um, one thing I also wanna point out is this road is marked as 20 miles an hour, low speed, and to be honest, almost anything works at 20 miles an hour, right? People, people can drive at 20 miles an hour on, on pretty crazy streets, but here's a good example of something uh, that helps create space for bicyclists and accommodates uh, this unusual practice of parking delivery trucks in the middle of the road. So it was installed in 2018. The city's been so happy with how this facility is work that it's planning on installing more edge lane roads throughout the town and other places. One other item to note is this road sees more than 7,000 cars per day on busy days. Uh, some of you may note that that uh, significantly exceeds the 6,000 ADT threshold where the MUTCD uh, requires a center line be used. Uh, we can talk about we can talk more about the history of that centerline recommendation, the METCD, if you want after the after the presentation. But it shows that this thing works. It works at uh, at higher volumes, uh, assuming there are lower speeds involved. Here's a picture showing a delivery truck uh, parked in the middle of the road and a car using those edge lanes to get around. Another application is uh, on-street shared use trail. I showed you an example of a sidewalk, which is primarily pedestrian uh, oriented. Here is an equally supportive, uh, both pedestrian and bicyclist uh, concept. Uh, what this involves is an on-street connector of a very popular trail in Vail, Colorado. It's uh, the Gore Valley Trail on Vail Valley Drive. You know, it's largely a tourist attraction. You only see uh, traffic on this facility during the summertime. On a busy summer day, they'll see about 1,100 bikes, 250 pedestrians, and 400 cars. Uh, this installation was started as a pilot, I think, two years ago now. They've made it permanent. They love it. Uh, they're sticking with it. Uh, they've had some, there are some site distance issues along on this facility, but they've been handled. They've seen very good compliance from all the road users and have gotten very good feedback when they have surveyed uh, the folks using that road. And the last application that I'll go over are low volume rural roads. And this application is what I'm going to be pointing to with this example is the use of edge lane roads on low volume rural roads to address the single vehicle roadway departure crash rate. Uh, this is a use of edge lane roads which doesn't specifically target vulnerable road users. It obviously provides a space for them, but uh, this is a use where it may benefit motorists only uh, even if you don't have any vulnerable road users around. So this facility here, this is a before picture, obviously. Uh, it was, this was part of the research we did on the safety of edge lane roads in the U.S. It's Eastern Road in Scarborough, Maine. It's a road that uh, doesn't have a lot of driveways on it. Uh, it accesses 
dispersed clusters of, of homes out in this rural area. The agency representative guessed that it, it had about a thousand cars per day. That sounds a little high given the number of homes on this road. It's posted 25 miles an hour, but given the crash uh, records, the crash data on this road, the actual speeds are likely quite a bit higher. We don't, we didn't have any speed survey data available. And so what we found on this road, when we looked at the crash data, is that prior to Edge Lane Road installation, they're about 14 years, they had an average of one crash per year on this road. And most of them, 11 of the 13, were single vehicle roadway departure crashes. Now, I, I go back and forth between 13 and 14 crashes. I'll just note that uh, one crash occurred right around the time of the installation of the Edge Lane Road. And a, we were unable to determine whether that crash happened before, during, or after the installation. So I'll sometimes toss that out from consideration. But we have this very consistent pattern of roadway departure crashes prior to the Edge Lane Road installation. And in the four plus years since the Edge Lane Road was installed, we've had absolutely no crashes whatsoever, and notably no head-on crashes uh, either. So I, I don't want to portray this use as uh, something that's been proven. Uh, it is, I believe, further research is warranted on this type of use. We have other successful examples besides Eastern Road in Scarborough. We've got the one in the upper right, that's in Scotland. Uh, very successful, been around a long time, 60 miles an hour. Uh, and my belief is that by creating these five to six foot wide shoulders, you get a huge potential for, for crash rate reduction by giving drivers much more room to correct and counter anything that might, might occur. Uh, in some European studies, you see a traffic calming effect of the edge lane road treatment by up to eight miles an hour. So of course, lower speeds helps that crash rate reduction. And of course, the big benefit is that you get a spot, a space for vulnerable road users. So we're heading into the, into the home stretch here. Uh, I just wanna wrap things up. Uh, this is the graph I like to think of when I consider edge lane roads. Uh, this is somewhat bike centric. We've got volume and speed on the X axis and the selection of treatment on the Y axis. Uh, edge lane roads really are applicable for a wide range of low volume, low speed streets. Uh, of course, they compete well with standard bike lanes in some settings, as, as I've shown. They're a great treatment for a bicycle boulevard. And one thing that you won't see on this graph are shared lane markings or shares. Uh, on any street that is a candidate for edge lane roads, shares shouldn't even be considered. Shares ensure or guarantee that vulnerable road users and cars share the same travel lane whereas edge lane roads ensure that each of those road users have their own space, except during the times when cars need to pass one another. That factor by itself, to me, makes edge lane roads far superior to shares uh, in all cases where they, where they can be used. And then of course, there's the other research data showing that unfortunately very few drivers very, and even few uh, cyclists understand that the sharrows are a positional device indicating where the cyclist should ride. All right, so wrapping up here, let's just take a look at some pros and cons of the treatment. Uh, pros, they're demonstrated safe, as I've shown earlier in this presentation. They have the potential to lower motor vehicle speeds. Narrow, narrow center lanes are, are crucial in that. They're extremely cheap. When you talk about public works construction projects, they're almost free. Uh, the big thing is they have no environmental impacts. So you, you're staying on that paved road, 
and you avoid the uh, costly and sometimes lengthy environmental assessment process. This treatment can extend your asphalt road life. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, the failure mechanisms common to an asphalt road are either rutting or uh, degradation of the asphalt edge, especially where it's unconstrained or unsupported. By moving your heavy motor vehicle volume traffic to the middle of the road and allowing it to vary its course as it travels down the road, you avoid the rutting that often happens and you remove those heavy loads from the edge of your asphalt uh, pavement. Of course, it provides facilities for your vulnerable road users. Uh, Win-lose becomes win-win. What I mean by that is that often when, you, when an agency goes to have a conversation about adding either pedestrian or bicyclist facilities to a street, there's often a tension that exists there where you have to start taking space away from the motorists in order to install those new facilities. Of course, with the edge lane road treatment, the entire road is still available to the motorists. And in addition, you get uh, vulnerable road user facilities. So it changes that dynamic around completely. And sweeping and snow removal. Uh, snow, very important issue in Vermont. Once you've addressed the street, once you've swept the street, once you've cleared the street of snow, you've also cleared your vulnerable road user facilities. So the cons. Uh, most of the cons stem from the fact that this treatment is new to the US. Uh, they appear simple, but believe me, they are not. If they were simple, our first try at guidance wouldn't have come out as badly as it did. Uh, I didn't talk about any of the design guidance issues around this treatment. That's a whole nother, a whole nother uh, webinar or presentation. Also, I'm a consultant, so I want you to hire me to help you with that. Uh, but they are commonly misdesigned. Uh, practitioners, drivers, road users can be wary of this uh, treatment uh, because it is new. Uh, the guidance that we have uh, didn't look at the lessons learned by other countries uh, with this treatment and has, for the moment, uh, relegated us to remaking the mistakes that those other countries made. And I'm, I'm hoping to keep that from happening as much as I can. And of course, the experimental status inhibits uptake. People don't like being on the bleeding edge. And the recent decision by the FHWA to discontinue considering requests to experiment has made that even worse. Uh, we're, myself and a number of other well-respected folks in the industry are, are organizing to convince the FHWA to consider another option to flat out uh, refusal to consider those requests. Uh, but we'll have to see what happens. All right, so that uh, winds things up for today. Uh, again, Edge Lane Roads or advisorybikelanes.com. There's a lot of information on that website, a lot of good design information. Uh, you've got my email there if you need to contact me. And at this point, we'll uh, go to questions. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And we have, uh, there was definitely some lively questioning happening. Uh, so I will put some of those to you. Uh, the first is actually, it's a little bit more of a comment. Um, this is from VTrans who, you know, folks on the VTrans side, I just want to make it clear that at the moment, you know, because there's no approval uh, coming from FHWA, that it would be against state law for a municipality to install an ELR um, without their request to experiment. So um, something to hold off on at the moment, but you know, when we when this process hopefully gets set up again um, with the FHWA, it's gonna be something likely to, to do sort of in concert with VTrans, but we'll see what that process looks like going forward. But for now, because FHWA is not approving um, requests to experiment, is not something that can be implemented at the moment. We learned about that just over the last couple of weeks after we had planned this webinar, but I think this is still really useful information and I'm hopeful that this is a treatment that will be available to Vermont communities. Um, 
I want to, so we had a lot of questions about striping and maintenance of the markings, um, especially with our winters here. Can you speak, Michael, a little bit to the implications of, you know, the markings becoming worn or unclear and potential safety issues and maybe how other, you know, how communities are handling that? Well, uh, there are a couple of issues there. Uh, number one, if you're repaving the street, striping is virtually free. Uh, you've got to restripe a, a road after a repaving. Uh, obviously, with an with an edge lane road, you have two broken lines rather than one. If a center line is all you're putting down, and so it might be a little more expensive in that case. Uh, with regards to maintenance. That depends on volume, uh, largely. Uh, it's surprising how quickly the rate of two cars approaching one another drops as your volume drops. Uh, one of the tasks that was undertaken in our research program was to develop a simula software simulation of the road, and we characterized how quickly that uh, that interaction rate of two cars approaching one, one another changes with uh, directional volume, uh, volume, speeds, length of facility, et cetera. And it doesn't take much before, uh, you know, a short installation, say half mile, quarter mile, which many of these are, uh, will see very few instances of cars approaching one another uh, at, at the low volumes we're talking about. Uh, with respect to maintenance, yes, if if one could imagine that the broken lines could disappear or wear away to nothing or be obscured by snow, but then you're back to a standard unmarked street, which is not uncommon, I would believe, in Vermont, uh, given the number of rural roads you have there. Uh, people know how to drive on those. Uh, people know how to how to stay out of the way of other cars. Uh, it hasn't been an issue, and, and I don't expect it to be an issue for, for those reasons. Thanks. All right, so next, um, you mentioned that, you know, in your research, there wasn't data collected on safety for people walking and biking. Um, is, is there any data on that? Um, also on, you know, frequency of people walking and biking being hit or forced off the road? Um, and then sort of connected to that, is there any data on mode share changes uh, with ELR installations? No, unfortunately, you know, the, the roads, we, we don't have data on that. Primarily what we don't have is we don't have counts. Uh, on roads where the edge lane road treatment is considered or applied, you're really talking about lower volume roads, roads of lesser priority in your network. And those are often the roads that get skipped when agencies go to count vulnerable road user use. So many of the roads, many of the installations, we simply don't know how many bicyclists, how many pedestrians are on those roads. And that really is a key, a key piece of data when you wanna look at safety. Uh, what we do know anecdotally is that all of the agencies we've talked to and this is, we're probably at 95% of the American agencies that have installed these. All of the agencies like the treatment, they would do it again, and they have no thoughts of removing the treatment uh, based on safety concerns alone. So at least anecdotally, we have a very consistent uh, perspective from the install from the responsible jurisdictions that uh, this treatment works, and uh, and they want to keep it keep it around. Got it. Yeah, that's definitely an issue there with just not having a lot of before data for a lot of these more rural roads. Um, I think you know we, there there were a lot of questions about you know and a lot of comments, and I, I certainly agree with this that there are you know significant cultural differences between roadway users here and in Europe, especially in. Um, in the Netherlands. Um, so what do you see as some of the implications of that, especially, you know, some of the educational needs based on those cultural differences? Uh, 
Well, that's a pretty big that's a pretty big question. I'm not sure I have the data to answer that. What I what I will address is that and I, and I am I completely agree that when you have a company like a country like the Netherlands where almost every driver is a bicyclist as well uh you do have a lack of bad behaviors for lack of a better phrase yeah you do have a lack of bad behaviors there that uh unfortunately doesn't exist in all cases in the united states but what you do have as i said earlier in the presentation is an existing expectation an existing practice of driving in such a way where you have to negotiate for passage between uh, two approaching cars on a constrained space uh, and i see that as really being the uh, the the factor that addresses the underlying issue you know if you've got one car that's not a big deal it, it, if, assuming they're staying in the center line and they're not being drunk or crazy or sick or distracted, which is a problem on any road, uh, you're going to be just fine. It's really the issue when you have two cars approaching one another uh, and what the impact of that might be on a nearby vulnerable road user. Um, and the other, the other perspective to take on this is what is the alternative? If you don't have an edge lane road there, what you likely have is either an unmarked road or a road with a center line with two travel lanes and no room for vulnerable road users at all. So in that case, you have vulnerable road users in the travel lane always. You're back in that Sharrow's configuration where a driver has been trained all their lives to stay to the right of that center line and he they come upon a, a cyclist or pedestrian they may move over you don't know how much they're going to move over if there's a car coming the other way often they'll try and skinny by the vulnerable road users at the same time they're passing that car so the alternative which is a standard two-lane road in my mind is a much less favorable alternative than the edge lane road treatment on the on a street that supports the treatment yeah, I, I think it is it is super important to keep, you know, make sure the alternative is the comparison here. You know, of course, uh, I think all of us would prefer to be on a shared use path or in a protected bike lane or a raised bike lane, but that's not always going to be the alternative. Um, in fact, in, in a lot of cases, it's not going to be the alternative, uh, at least not right now. Um, and Jonathan, even in the Netherlands, that's not always the alternative, right? So there are many, as I'm showing right here, there are many rural roads in the Netherlands where they don't have protected or separate facilities. And they go with uh, these on-street shared facility types. Uh, and again, we can get into the d debate about cultural, but uh, you know, that's just a fact of life. You have as some amount of money and you can't make everything separated or protected yeah um so there, there were a few different questions sort of getting at um design guidance um and especially on rural roads so one was about um you know rural collectors with speeds in the 35 to 45 mile an hour range but low volumes um there was another about you know a couple questions about sight lines especially on rural roads um, and then a third about intersections and driveways and the applicability on roads that have those. So that's a lot, but hopefully you can get into it. <laughs> well, those are all good questions and those are all, uh, I have a whole separate webinar on design guidance for this treatment. Uh, if, if people are truly interested in those issues, I have a design guide on my website that what it does is it takes what the FHWA has published and compares and contrasts it with uh, research and guidance issued by 
Denmark and the Netherlands primarily. I think I've got some German guidance in there, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I've also got a copy of a recent article that was published in ITE Journal that I wrote on a site distance criterion that is applicable to edge lane roads. Uh, it's interesting, this, this treatment is unusual in that it requires a site distance model unique from other treatments. Uh, there are There is site distance guidance in the AASHTO documents, notably the, I'm gonna not quote the title exactly, but it's the Low Volume Roads Guide. Uh, but uh, they have recommendations there and what to do for site distance in terms of two-way, one-lane roads. That gets pretty close to what you need for an edge lane road, but really I think the uh, you really need to take a look at the article in the IT journal when it comes to site distance criterion, and that's, that's a whole separate issue. I, I would go well over the time we have right now if I, if I tried to tackle any of those things. Yeah, we can uh, we can provide links to those resources in the follow-up email. Um, and if there's interest, maybe we'll have you for uh, another talk focused on some of the nitty-gritty of design. Um, how how should we think about the rules of the road for um, for pedestrians and equestrians um, using these facilities? Are they supposed to be on the right side, the left side? Is an edge lane road even for pedestrians? What are your thoughts on all that? My thoughts on that is that that is a gray area, and I'm not sure I have a I'm not sure I have a well thought out answer to that yet. Uh, and, and what you're referring to is uh, most states have a law stating that pedestrians should walk facing traffic on roads where sidewalks don't exist, uh, and on an edge lane road, the question becomes, all right, is, does that law make sense for pedestrians or equestrians or, or whoever you might be thinking about? Does that law make sense on a road that is essentially a shared street treatment? And that, that's a point I wanna make. I don't think I made it in the presentation, excuse me if I did. But these aren't real, a lot of these people, a lot of people think of these as advisory bike lanes or advisory lanes that's really missing the point. Uh, this is a this is an, a whole road treatment. It's, these are not lanes that you tack on to an existing road. This is a shared street treatment uh, and it just happens to be to have these things that look like lanes inside of them. That, that's my take on it. So whether or not it makes sense for a pedestrian to walk facing traffic or against or, or with traffic, I don't have a good answer to, and that that is something that can be debated. Uh, what I find is, just like on other streets, pedestrians largely do whatever the heck they want. They'll walk on against traffic or with traffic, depending on where they're going, how challenging the street feels at the moment. Uh, if they're walking with somebody, it's what the conditions of the street are. Uh, so my feeling is that pedestrians are going to do what they want uh, and good luck trying to regulate whether they're walking with or against traffic. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think there's a larger point here about as we become more formalized and more common, the, the safety and the predictability will also probably improve. Um, when it, you know, there's a question about um, bollards being used or, you know, posts being used basically on the on the edge line to provide a, additional separation and maybe traffic calming. And this is going to be our last question, but can you speak a little bit to, you know, traffic calming treatments that could maybe be used in combination with the edge lane road treatment? Uh, I would strongly advise against bollards. Uh, there are... There are treatments. I, I didn't. I have some pictures of some excellent traffic calming treatments uh, that I've seen in the Netherlands on these types of roads. Uh, one that I really like, which is subtle, is, and this only works on roads with 
that are used that are paved with pavers, uh, but they actually create a little bump right on that broken line. And so that encourages drivers to get up to get out of the edge lane if they're there. Um, but that's that's likely not going to be feasible on asphalt paved roads. But that is a, a lovely, clever, minimalist uh, approach to traffic calming for these roads. Uh, there are other options. Um, you might need traffic calming. Say you have a uh, where people uh, like to think bollards might be useful is around a corner. Uh, and of course, uh, what the corner is presenting you with is a sight distance restriction. And so the first thing you need to figure out is, does the sight distance restriction really create a problem? Assuming it does, then you want to look at, all right, is it the speed that is the problem? Is it the position of the driver that's problem, the position of the vehicle that's problem? What's the actual problem you're addressing? Uh, if it's speed, well, we know about a lot of traffic calming treatments. Uh, we can narrow up the center lane. We can put in a speed hump, a speed table, a speed bump, uh, whatever style of vertical deflection you might like. Uh, there are horizontal deflection uh, possibilities as well. Uh, choke points, which are a use of bollards, uh, if you will. Um, but I strongly prefer not using bollards, uh, especially next to facilities where bicyclists are present, unless it's well illuminated and uh, you're not going to get a problem with the cyclists running into the bollards. Uh, that's my main concern with the bollards is the impact on the cyclists. So you have a lot of options open to you uh, for traffic calming or sight distance uh, for, or addressing sight distance problems, but it really depends on the, the specific problem you're trying to address uh, at that spot on the road. Great, well, I wanna say thank you so much, uh, Michael. This is great, I think it was really informative. We had a lot of good discussion. Couldn't get to all the questions today, um, but we I will send links to those design guidance uh, documents in the follow-up email, and I think there's some good info in there that speaks to some of the more detailed questions. Uh, that we couldn't get to. Um, thanks so much everyone for attending. I hope this was helpful. Feel free to uh, send feedback, comments, or questions my way uh, and hope to talk to you soon. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody.